Okay, so it's a great pleasure to have Amy Wilkinson from the University of Chicago here, and she will talk about dynamical asymmetry is C1 typical. Or asymmetrical diffeomorphisms. Oh, okay. Yes, I changed the title. Oh. So I'd like to say, I, I, I want to explain something about some work I did some time ago. My co-authors, uh, Sylvain Corlizier and Christian Bonatti. Um, part because it motivates some more recent work I've been doing with other collaborators, which I might have a chance at the end to mention, but um, I thought this was a nice topic to discuss. It's a beautiful picture, or I'm sorry if I may say so myself. Um, it, it, I, there's lots of nice pictures, so let's get started. All right, so. This talk is about diffeomorphisms. I'm a smooth dynamicist. I study diffeomorphisms and flows. Um, and there's a, a kind of flavor to this talk that emphasizes to a certain extent the fact that the space of all diffeomorphisms of a closed manifold is in fact a group. Um, it, so to set up some background, M, we fix a closed connected manifold, and diff R of M is just the space of diffeomorphism, CR, of the manifold. R is an integer greater than or equal to 1. Um, it will play a role in what I'm going to say. My What I'm going to say is not going to work for all R, and in fact, the answers to some of the questions I ask will depend on the value of R. Um, so, if R of M, or in fact any group of auto automorphisms of an object, is uh, a topo it's a group, and it's in fact a topological group if you endow it with the CR topology. The operation is composition, inversion is just inversion, and the identity is the identity map. Um, and those operations are continuous in the CR topology. Um, so it's complete and therefore a bare space as well. And I'm going to be talking about generic properties of diffeomorphisms. Um, so it's important we keep in mind what is a bare space. A bare space is one in which a countable intersection of open and dense set sets is dense. Um, and such a set um, I call, well, a dense G delta. Um, and um, a residual set, when I talk about a residual set, I mean a set that contains a countable intersection of open and dense sets. So it's a very large set from a topological point of view. Um, an interesting fact that a surprising number of people have not seen before, but I'd like to add this. It's a theorem of Filipkowitz from 1982 that states that in fact, this group is completely sort of as uh, a, a group of diffeomorphisms is actually completely determined by its algebraic structure in the sense that if I have two different groups of CR diffeomorphisms, even CK and CL diffeomorphisms of manifolds M and N, and I have an algebraic isomorphism between those groups, just a group isomorphism, then M and N are diffeomorphic K and L are the same, and that diffeomorphism induces that automorphism of groups. So it's a very interesting group to study. I'm only going to kind of a little bit touch on the group structure, um, but it's good just to have in mind as a background kind of fact. Okay, so um, what does classical dynamics do? Well, it fixes a diffeomorphism. Um, and considers its iterates. So iterates just mean I take F, I compose it with itself repeatedly, um, and I look at orbits of points in M under this iteration and ask what happens as N goes to infinity or N goes to minus infinity. So do I see periodic orbits, that is points that come back to themselves? What kind of recurrence do I see? So periodic Periodicity is the simplest form of recurrence, but you can have other ways that points can come back to themselves sort of infinitely often. Um, are there orbits that are dense? That's a property called transitivity. 
Uh, and then further questions about dynamical invariance and chaotic behavior and so on. Um, modern dynamics, um, in quotes, um, would consider subgroups of the group of diffeomorphisms, uh, which subgroups can occur uh, if you have enough complexity in a group. Does it, um, an abstract group, does it prohibit it from being a subgroup of the group of diffeomorphisms? So are there types of rigidity? Um, and you can ask about the dynamics of these subgroups. So iteration of a single diffeomorphism is an action of the integers. Um, and looking in the past and the future is sort of going out to the ends of the group. But if you have other subgroups that are acting, you can sort of ask similar things if the groups are infinite what kind of orbit structure or behaviors do you see in the limit? So this is just something of a little bit of an overview. All right, so now the role of R comes in. And it comes in the following way. I wanna ask for some of these basic dynamical properties such as these, um, which properties are generic or hold for a residual set of F. So which properties of a dynamical system are typical in that particular sense? Um, there are other senses in which you could ask for a property to be generic. You could ask that it just holds for a dense set. Okay, you'd say well, that, that's a pretty typical property. The problem with asking for a property of a dynamical system to hold on a dense set of dynamical systems is the opposite property as well can hold for a dense set. So it's a kind of a weak sense of something being very typical. Whereas if I have a residual set and I intersect it with another residual set, I get a residual set. So you can't have a property and its opposite both hold it generically. Um, so this is the notion of typicality or generic genericity I'm gonna focus on in this talk but there are others as well. Okay, so there are in fact known properties to hold for a generic, you know, pick a dynamical system at random. Um, not very many, however, the most famous is a pretty old one. Uh, it goes back to the early work of Steve Smale uh, in attempting to classify diffeomorphisms and that's known as the Kupka-Smale theorem. And it seems pretty obvious um, if, if the way, uh, well, the way it's stated, it seems like a good property to be generic. So it says in any topology, CR topology, if I take a generic diffeomorphism, so one that belongs to a residual set, and I look at the number of fixed points of the kth iterate, that number is finite. So generically, periodic points for a diffeomorphism of a fixed period are isolated. So in particular, there's only countably many periodic orbits. Um, and in fact, you can say more, those periodic orbits are hyperbolic, which means when they come back, the derivative of the return map has all of its eigenvalues off the unit circle. Um, so this is, and, and there's even a little bit more to this theorem. Um, this is actually a highly unusual theorem uh, in the sense, well, in two senses. The first is that it's actually a theorem about generic diffeomorphisms. If you think about it, there's not many things you would expect a generic dynamical system, many properties you would expect it to have. Um, there have been questions that have been posed, like, well, does the generic diffeomorphism have this property? And it's later turned out to be false. So um, a famous example being ergodicity, um, but I won't be talking about ergodicity today. Um, it's also atypical in that it's actually been proved for all R. So um, as you change the smoothness class, um, you, um, you're looking, first of all, you're looking at different diffeomorphisms, they're getting smoother and smoother and smoother. Um, and if you compare CR and CR plus one topologies, well, they are comparable. So it's harder for two things to be 
CR plus one close than it is for them to be CR close. So CR plus density is a stronger property than CR density, but CR openness is a stronger property than CR plus one openness. And since residual comes from taking an intersection of open and dense, there's no comparability between a CR generic and a CR plus one generic property. So in a sense, this is a separate result for each R, although the same conclusion. There's, there's no condition on M? That is any, so for, for the entire background for this, M is a closed manifold oh. connected, let's say. Maybe oriented, but I don't even think we need that orientable. Okay. Um, so many genericity results um, have been established only for R equals one, and there aren't many of them that actually hold for all diffeomorphism. And so I wanted, because I'm going to focus today on the C1 topology, which I think is a nice, interesting topology. Um, there's one for every R, so there's room for everyone to have a different favorite topology, but I think it's a pretty nice one. Um, and the reason that a lot of these results have only, or what is known has only been uh, established for the C1 topology is that um, the density is really hard to establish in C2 topology. So a lot of nice properties, like the ones that are behind the Kupke mill uh, theorem uh, come from C1 open properties. Like if I know all my periodic points up to period 10 are hyperbolic, then that persists under perturbation C1. But to do a C1 <laughs> R approximation is different than doing a C1 approximation. So the C1 topology is much more flexible, and that's what accounts for this, this discrepancy here. And I want to give a, a famous example. Um, this is a theorem that holds for all diffeomorphisms, one of those rare, uh, rare birds. Um, and this is the closing lemma of Charles Pugh, who is actually my thesis advisor. Um, it was uh, basically his thesis work um, from 1967. So here's what it says. It says, suppose I have a diffeomorphism or a flow and I have a um, point that is recurrent. So its orbit returns to the point infinitely often arbitrarily close to the point, okay? The question is, can you perturb the diffeomorphism to make that point periodic, closing up the orbit? It's a very simple question, okay? Um, and, um, it was claimed, so this question was uh, thought about quite a bit by Mauricio Peixoto, uh, who was sort of Pew's semi-advisor. Um, and in fact, there were proofs that you could do this in arbitrary smoothness that turned out to be false. Um, and um, Pew finally proved that um, under an arbitrarily small C1 perturbation, one could actually attain this kind of closure. And this leads, this, this density type result actually leads to a genericity result, which I will mention later, okay? But let's just focus on the closing lemma. And I just wanted to show you a picture of why uh, C1 seems to make a difference. So here is a crude drawing of an orbit, in this case, an orbit of a flow that is very close to being periodic. These parts of the orbit are coming very close back to themselves. And let's focus on this little region where we're seeing a lot of recurrence and see, well, can we close up this orbit? So if you trace this orbit around, you kind of, I don't know, it's, you have to kind of put a finger on it. You can see that there's one place where if we just switched one of these strands a little bit, and it's these two strands, if we just switch two of these strands, so instead of this strand going out, we take this strand and I think make it go up like this. Let's see if I was right, yes. And then move this strand away. This orbit can't continue to go here because it's a flow, so it has to go somewhere else. And by doing this, we actually close up the orbit. So this is a perturbation that closes the orbit. But if you'll notice, and it's not just that I drew the picture to look this way, 
This is a C0 small. In other words, it's a uniformly small perturbation that moves these two orbits together, but it is not C1 small because right up here, the derivative of the curve is zero and here the derivative is you know, minus a half or something. That's a big change in derivative over a very small area. And in reality, because these orbits can come back, it's not a very predictable way geometrically how pieces of an orbit are going to recur. There's no way via a local perturbation that you can sort of do this kind of trick without making large changes to the derivative in a small area. So in fact, so this is not C1 small, um, and in fact, if you try to do like, well, I'll just take this perturbation and then sort of smooth it out and make it look C1 small, you don't close the orbit. That's what I just said. And so what Pew's, Pew did succeed in the C1 topology uh, in closing up any orbit like this, um, but how he does it, well, there's sort of two steps. And one is a careful kind of combinatorial selection of the right pieces of orbit to close up, to bring together. So you don't just sort of take two that are closest and try to put them together. So there's some careful selection. So these are the two that you want to actually, I think, bring together. And then the other step is to realize the perturbation that needs to be done by adapting it to the dynamics, to actually what the diffeomorphism is doing on the infinitesimal level. And you have to then, having sort of observed what the diffeomorphism does, you take advantage of the dynamics and you make little pushes to the dynamics along the entire orbit to close it up. And that's how you make it C1 small. Now, to do that, in the C2 topology turns out to be impossible. And there are examples where there is no way, it's, they're related to the horror cyclic flow, in fact, if you know what that is, where there's no way via a, an orbit that is support, I'm sorry, a perturbation that is supported in a neighborhood of an orbit can actually close that orbit in a C2 small way. And so the question of whether the closing lemma is true for C2 is an open question, which is kind of remarkable. It's been since 1967. Okay, so this is just an illustration of one problem, and I'll give you many other problems that continue to be open in higher topologies. But the C1 topology is very nice, and the two reasons that it is nice that I want to highlight are very, very simple. The first is, well, the definition of differentiable. It just says a map is differentiable if it can be approximated very well on small scales by an affine map. So the derivative is a linear map that approximates out. So this is true also for C2 diffeomorphisms. In fact, they're approximable by polynomials. Um, but it turns out C1 is really good enough to have some control. But like by contrast, Lipschitz maps do not have this property. So, you know, there's a difference, a big difference there. And the other is a property that's, um, so this is sort of a type of like rigidity in some sense. You have some control over what C1 maps look like when you're on a small scale. This on the other hand is a kind of flexibility. And this says that if you rescale a map, you don't change its C1 size. And that is a property that is not shared with C2 diffeomorphism. So all that is saying is if I want to make a certain change, I can fix a template where I want to do a certain type of perturbation at macro scale. And then if I want to do a perturbation like this at a really small scale, I can blow up that small piece to macro scale, do the perturbation, and then blow it back down. And whatever the C1 size is here is the C1 size here. Okay. But if you do that for C2, it's just, it does, that does not work. And it's, it's the simple chain rule. If I differentiate this with respect to X once, the row inverse cancels the row and everything's fine. But if I differentiate twice, I get a one over row and things blow up. Okay. So, yeah, I think I even 
yeah, I even did the to differentiate it there. Okay, so because of these two properties, there's actually been huge progress in understanding the space of C1 diffeomorphisms from a very global kind of view, from a viewpoint of what properties are generic, what properties are open, what properties, like, how can we classify these diffeomorphisms according to their dynamics? And I have a huge list of names here um, emitting I can already see names that I'm emitting, so I'm just going to click very fast so you don't see them. But just to give you an idea, I'll share with you just a picture that um, Christian Bonatti, one of my co-authors, who's really the expert on the C1 topology, has sort of built. Now, this was more than 10 years ago, but I think it's still a pretty good picture of uh, a kind of um, classification scheme for the dynamics of C1 diffeomorphisms of a closed manifold, starting with the simplest gradient-like systems that we call them, more small, up to systems with universal dynamics. Um, and these are all, this in this whole classification scheme, all of these different properties are things that can be seen in open sets of diffeomorphisms, typically generically within open sets. Okay. So now I want to go back um, to uh, kind of <laughs> the main subject of my talk today, which is um, to consider subgroups of the group of diffeomorphisms. And now let's do an interplay between algebraic properties and the properties of the topology. So let's consider subgroups. Um, so for example, Z, that would be uh, an individual iteration of an individual element, um, and this question that I posed before. Um, so what would be a good type of generic property to study in this context? So I'm going to put aside questions of rigidity, which is questions of which groups can't even occur. And what might be a good generic type of property? Well, if you ask yourself, is the generic prop is the generic group going to be uh, solvable? Pretty easily, you're going to discover that the answer is false because there's actually a lot of free groups inside of diff of M, and there's even concrete ways to construct them, simple ways, unlike the circle by a process called ping pong. Um, well, in fact, if I take tuples of diffeomorphisms inside of this group and I put the appropriate topology, then the generic tuple actually generates a free group. And that's not a difficult argument, and I might have left the slide up to show you it. Okay, so um, it would seem from this perspective that asking properties algebraic for algebraic properties for generic elements would be kind of a hopeless task since the generic group that is generated is free. But here's a very similar question that was um, posed actually by Smale, um, which is really not easy, okay? Um, so look at the generic F and then look at the relations that F satisfies with other elements of diff. So it's a slight shift rather than um, looking at sort of how all elements interact at once, you fix one element and then here's probably the simplest question you can ask. Does it commute with any other elements? Or another way of posing this more dynamically is what, what, is, what are the set of symmetries of a generic diffeomorphism? Okay, Because a diffeomorphism that commutes with F is another way of viewing that is it's a smooth change of coordinates that gives you the same dynamics back. Okay, so now this group of diffeomorphisms, the centralizer, because it's literally the group centralizer inside of diff. Um, well, it's a subgroup, it's a centralizer after all, and it always contains the iterative F, iterates of F, because you always commute with your iterates. And so the question is, is it true that generic, the generic diffeomorphism has no non-trivial symmetries or is it centralized or trivial? I think this is a great question because if you start to, if you try to guess what properties could hold for the generic F, 
I mean, even just to think what could hold for all, what non-trivial thing could actually hold for dynamical, for a generic dynamical system? Well, not having any symmetries is a good one. Um, you know, the same question that you, or similar question that you might ask for, say, C infinity, say, symplectomorphisms, uh, is it always ergodic? Like, is there no invariant? Is it act randomly? That's false because of KAM theory. But here's a very similar question that has a good chance of being true. Um, and in fact, um, way back in 1970, uh, Steve Smale's student, Nancy Capel, who's now a famous um, applied mathematician, answered this question on the circle for all R at least two. And she proved something uh, even stronger than what is posed in the question. She proved that there's an open and dense set of diffeomorphisms of the circle with trivial centralizer so that no other diffeomorphism commutes with it except it, its own powers. And this was for R greater than or equal to two because actually this theorem is false for R equals one, which is kind of interesting. Um, and so the old result that I was um, referring to that I wanted to say something about with the pictures and everything um, is um, for the case R equals one. Before I say that, there's partial results where if you look in certain subclasses of the space of C2 or C infinity diffeomorphisms, you have this generic trivial centralizer. And Pallas and Yokos were two who studied this um, a long time ago for um, Axiom A and Anosov systems. And there's a couple of former students of mine who studied these for partially hyperbolic diffeomorphisms. And so this is the result I wanted to say something about sort of this background for my current interests. Uh, and this, as I said, this was um, with uh, Christian Bonatti and Sylvain Provisier. And we proved that on any manifold, any closed manifold, um, the generic diffeomorphism has trivial centralizer in the C1 topology. Okay, so what's what's like an application of this? So what did you say about S1 when R is one? Uh, it's false. It's not an op not true for an open and dense. It's true for a residual set of so there are open sets of diffeomorphisms with uncountable with a large centralizer, yeah, on the circle. Um, so this implies, for example, that the C1 generic diffeomorphism homotopic to the identity does not embed in a flow. So that's a simple question. I mean, you might ask, it's sort of like, well, yeah, the exponential map on diff is not surjective, right? And so this is kind of related to that. So that's an open, that's an easier result. And that was proved by Pallas some time ago. That's open in the C2 topology. That's simple. So that's one I feel like someone should be able to answer, but okay. So in other words, there's a residual subset so that um, all elements in that subset um, commute only with their powers. Are there any questions on the statement? Okay, so I just wanted to sketch out one of the techniques in the proof, which relies on quite a bit of um, prior theory, but also has definitely some novel arguments to it. And one of the kind of novel, but simple, simple, simple ideas uh, can be captured in the case of the interval. So let me, let me show you this. So suppose I have F, a map on the interval, uh, and it has a fixed point. Let's just do this case where we have a map with a fixed point, uh, some kind of attracting fixed point. So we'll have to have derivative, could be derivative one if you want. Let's keep it orientation preserving. And suppose G is also a map on the interval um, that commutes with F. We're not going to say much about G for a while. We're just going to focus on F. Let's take a point X on the interval and look at its iterates under F. So because this is the only attracting fixed point, the iterates of F are going to converge on that point X. 
Okay, and since f and g, assuming f and g commute, uh, that implies that g commutes with the power of f, the powers of s. And then applying the chain rule, we get the following equation, which is sort of strangely hard to read. But write g prime at this point times f to the k prime at this is f to the k prime at this point times g prime of x. And so let's just write this um, by dividing both sides as a new equality. We get the following statement. So this says for any k greater than zero, for any x and for any k um, greater than or equal to one, the derivative of f to the k at x, which is here, divided by f to the k at g of x, which I don't know, somewhere else, right? Is equal to the ratio of the derivatives of g at two different points, one here and one close to that point here. So what is important to note in this equation is that we have a k appearing here, a statement that's true for all iterates of f, and then we have a ratio that's sort of bounded a priori. G is a diffeomorphism. This lies in some interval uh, between you know, one over c and c. And the claim is that that is highly non-generic. And so this is what you can prove with a little bit of, you know, bare and just playing around with the interval. Uh, the generic F has what I'll call the unbounded distortion property. So this is this type of ratio is often referred to as distortion in dynamics. It's just taking a very high iterate and looking at derivatives at two different points. A priori, this should blow up. If you have, you know, because you're taking this is by the chain rule, this is a multiple of derivative of f at well along two different orbits. Why should these two things be close? And in fact, for C2 diffeomorphisms, in exactly this type of setting, if I take x and g of x, if g of x is say close to x, uh, or even if it's not close to x, in the C2 setting, this will actually be bounded. So there'll be no contradiction in this statement. But in the C1 setting, um, there is um, a problem. So I said this will always be bounded, but that's not exactly true because if G happens to be on the orbit of, um, sorry, if this point happens to be F to the K happens, sorry, if the point, uh, G of X happens to be on the orbit of F, then that can be unbounded. Okay, so I said that slightly wrong, but so this is a, a generic property though. The only way that I can have two points where the ratio of these derivatives stays bounded is if one of these points is just on the orbit of F and you've just, you know, basically taken out a few terms in the denominator. Okay, so that it won't depend on K. Okay, and so this allows you then to prove that any G that commutes with F has to be a power of F. Because F G, therefore, since this holds for all K and every X, for any X, there is um, an L such that G of X is F to the L. But clearly that L has to be locally constant, and so therefore G is F to the L. Okay, yes, there are two sides of this point, so you're going to have to use CL, the C1-ness to show that that L is the same on both sides. But anyway, that's the basic proof. So it relies on the fact that a generic C1 generic diffeomorphism of the interval is really not C2, which we all know anyway. So C2 is dense, but not generic. Okay, so our proof then is kind of adapts this and one other idea and puts it together with a picture of what the C1 generic diffeomorphism looks like. This is work. Um, this is summarizing right now work that occurred prior to our paper. And this is the work that we use to kind of complete our proof. And most of it, well, I'll tell you which of the work I'm gonna use. So here's M, our manifold. It's a blobby looking manifold. Um, and I've depicted a set of periodic points. Maybe there's a lot of them. Um, and some manifolds that, that could be empty, right? 
So it's not even, um, it is known that for the generic diffeomorphism, there are periodic points. That that's, that's actually follows from Pew's there. But um, anyway, so we've got periodic points. Um, and I've just tried to distinguish the points of different period by making the higher period ones smaller. So that just gives you a picture of them being isolated. That's the kupke smail theorem. It says there's only finitely many of a given period. And now if we go, um, oh, now I'm gonna just draw some more pictures to explain some more things. So when you analyze the diffeomorphism, um, there, in fact, a homeomorphism, there's some basic subsets, invariant subsets that one wants to extract to really analyze the structure. Um, and one of the basic subsets is called the wandering set. The wandering set is just the set of all points that have a neighborhood that accompany that point forever, whose iterates accompany that point forever, never returning. Okay. So what points wander? Well, this, so perhaps one has um, a, a set here, an open set that moves to another open set here, that moves to another open set, that moves to another open set, and so on. That can happen in a dissipative dynamical system, such as a diffeomorphism, generic diffeomorphism. So those points would be wandering. These points surrounding this periodic point, well, these are points where this periodic point is actually not part of the wandering set because, of course, periodic points don't wander. They stand still or they often come back. But all the points that are in the basin of this periodic point, which is a sink, are wandering because they, they spend their lives trying to reach that periodic point and never getting there. So they have little neighborhoods that wander. So these points are wandering because they're basins of sinks. Of course, most periodic, not most, but a lot of periodic points are probably not sinks or sources. So sources behave the same way, except they repel. So these are probably saddle periodic points. Okay, so that's a picture, a depiction of the wandering set, which is an important. And the complement of the wandering set is a compact set called the non-wandering set. And the non-wandering set is where the interesting dynamics take place. For those points, every neighborhood of the point will return eventually after iteration. Um, and Pew proved that periodic points, so this is a consequence of Pew's theorem, the closing theorem, generically now, periodic points are dense in the non-wandering set. And the non-wandering set is always non-empty. That's not hard to show. So generically, there are always periodic points, and in fact, they're always dense in the non-wandering set. Obviously, wandering points, wandering points cannot be approximated by periodic points. So that summarizes Pew's theorem. Okay, and now we're going. Now I want to state the main result that we classification result, which also built, builds on work of um, a bunch of other people. Um, but this main work is by Bonatti and Corbusier, um, and it says the following: Take the wandering, the non-wandering set, and look at its interior. Okay, so obviously, um, it's you know, the interior of the, uh, this being a complex set, I mean, it could have empty interior, the wandering set could be dense, but um, it, this is not the case generically, because what generically happens is if, if we take the interior of the non-wandering set, and we take any connected component of the interior, and we take any periodic point in that interior, the stable and unstable manifold of that point is dense. So what does that mean? Any point in the non-wandering set can be approximated arbitrarily well by a point that under forward iteration eventually converges on the orbit of that periodic point. So why is this useful? Well, because these wandering regions In these wandering, first let's look at the wandering regions. In the wandering regions, you have dynamics that in some ways resembles the dynamics of F being attracted to this fixed point. 
And it does in the sense that I can make perturbations in these regions that won't affect anything outside of these regions and which won't, if a, if a neighborhood wanders, it never comes back. And so if I wanna do something along the orbit of this point and I don't, and I can do it, I can make changes here and those changes will be in effect forever in some sense. Whereas if I had a point that was non-wandering and kept coming back to itself, then if I make a small change here, say to the derivative, then that will affect the derivative of many of its iterates. But once I come back to this region, it'll have that effect again, and I can't control the perturbation. So within regions like this, I can control perturbations. And along this unstable manifold, which are stable manifold, which is dense in here, where things look pretty insane, I can sort of roll it out. And really, I'm just looking at, well, in this case, it's a curve. I'm just looking at a line with a fixed point in the middle. And so if I can make very small perturbations the same as I do in one dimension that mostly just affect points on this line, I can achieve the same kind of goal on a dense set. So this is a way of dividing my manifold, an open and dense set of my manifold into things that are either wandering or sort of wandering on some lower dimensional submanifold. And so I can apply the argument I showed there um, and so that's what we do. So the first thing we do is we perturb along first an open and dense set of points. We perturb the derivative of iterates, in particular the Jacobian, which is just a number of the derivative down points in such a way that any two points can be distinguished by their derivatives. In other words, if I know the derivative is blowing up at this point and it's not blowing up along this orbit, for example, I know that this point here cannot be an iterate of this point. Okay, so one more time. I have F and I know the derivative along this orbit blows up or gets very large. And I have another point and I know the derivative doesn't blow up. Then if G commutes with F, it cannot take this orbit to this orbit. It's just a simple, right? And so these, or any point on this orbit, to any point of this orbit, these points are distinguished by their derivatives along their orbits. And these perturbations are possible because of the C1 topology. Now, you can sort of locally, if you have two compact sets, you can sort of perturb, there's a, there's a lot of kind of work to do that I won't go into. But it is possible to sort of perturb orbits in two different compact sets and then use the bear category theorem to get a residual set um, to all the wandering points and the points on the stable manifold that you can distinguish orbits, okay? So what this implies is that for the generic F, if G commutes with F, then on each component, G has to be a power of F, okay? So it almost we're almost done. If we could just show that those numbers are constant, then we know that anything commuting with F is a power. So one more time, I have to emphasize G is arbitrary. We're putting conditions on F that force any G that commute with F to have this property. Okay, so this is actually where things get rather tricky because, um, sorry, this I, it was not the derivative here. It was the distortion that we blew up just in the, exactly in the way of the one dimensional case. Here we blow up the derivative and to blow up derivatives, um, it forces these LIs to be bounded. Okay, so it's another change in derivative. This is complicated because this condition, the unbounded, the unboundedness of derivatives along orbits is not a residual con condition. It's a meager condition. So we have a generic condition that implies this, and then we have to do a further perturbation that gives you this. Now we have a dense set, it's no longer residual, then we have to argue more to get a residual set. 
Um, but once you have these LIs bounded, it's not much harder to show that um, once these LIs are bounded, they have to be constant. Basically, once the LIs are bounded, then they have to be um, constant along orbits of non-periodic points, and then you just have to deal with periodic points, and it's not hard. Okay, so this gives a dense set of with this large trivial centralizer, and then to get um, a residual set requires um, some tricks. And I just want to mention, you might ask, well, what about flows? And there are some um, related results. First, just looking, if you have a vector field, uh, you can look at all the flows that commute with flows, and that's a much easier question to handle because commuting flows, well, like Hamiltonian flows, you can say a lot, right? Commuting, even commuting vector fields, you can say quite a bit, right? So you have Lie brackets. Um, and then this, this is some more serious work um, for uh, vector field center. This is um, significantly harder work, <laughs> I would just say. And this is kind of the optimal result, but only on surfaces. So the question in flows is quite a bit, um, actually rather open as well. Just wanted to say that. Um, and just a few more questions. Um, so I mentioned that the set of, uh, oh, I'll, I'll get to that later. Let's, let's look at this question first. So let's go back to Gis's theorem that says that the generic pair of, I guess I didn't include the proof. I skipped that slide. I can tell you about that proof, but the generic pair of diffeomorphisms generate a free group. So what about if we fix a word like FG equals, or fix a relation like FG equals GF, and we just look at the diffeomorphisms that satisfy that. That's a closed, that's clearly a closed, um, subset of, of diff 1M cross diff 1M, what is its local topology? It's, there's some understanding of this question on the circle. Um, on the circle, I believe it's, it might be locally connected or something very close, but that's what's known. So, and now this question. So, um, the set of diffeomorphisms. So just to a little comment about arguments that use the bare category theorem. So often when you want to prove a property is residual, you first prove that it's a G delta. So it's an intersection, countable intersection of open dense set, or sorry, a countable intersection of open sets. And then you show it's dense and then it's residual. This is not a countable intersection of open sets. And that's what makes this problem especially hard. So it's not enough to show that this is dense. You really have to work to show that this set contains a residual set. It is not a countable intersection of open dense sets. So what is this set? Does it have interior? Is it even a Borel set? And Matt Forbin has some related questions about this in the measurable category where I think um, measure preserving transformations, this is not, it's an analytic set, but not a Borel set. So, but I don't know, still don't know the answer in this case. And then in the last few minutes, um, I wanted to just mention kind of, so where do you go with this work from 10 years ago? Why am I still interested in this work? Okay, so, um, so you have this nice generosity result. It'd be great if it's true in dimension for R equals two. I just don't have a clue how you would prove that. Maybe there's more. It's also true for C1 symplectomorphisms and C1 volume preserving diffeomorphisms, where the proof is actually easier than for ordinary, but um, all in C1. But here's a question. So now suppose I have a diffeomorphism whose trivial, whose centralizer is not trivial. Maybe that says something very special about that diffeomorphism. Is there some kind of rigidity? Well, not in general. I mean, the centralizer of a diffeomorphism can be rather huge and it can be very much not finite dimensional. It can be very much have a complicated group structure. Um, but 
if you restrict your, your vision to a neighborhood of diffeomorphisms, and now we're talking smooth diffeomorphisms, where the centralizer is something understood, then you can actually say something. And that's sort of the theme we have. So this is work with Daniela Damjanovic and Di Sheng Shu over the last five years. And so the, the basic, this is the crudest of caricatures of what we're doing, but we're looking inside the space of all C infinity diffeomorphisms of the manifold, where the manifold itself comes say from algebra. Maybe it's a compact homogeneous space. Um, I'd love to do this in cases in, in like more cases coming from like, you know, algebra of geometry even, but you know, basically these are G mod gammas. Okay. Um, not, not exclusively. Um, and then within, because this manifold is, um, is, uh, sort of algebraic in nature, it has, um, some highly symmetric systems, namely like affine diffeomorphisms. They're highly generic, highly symmetric in the sense that they have a lot more symmetries than the generic diffeomorphism. Like, let me give you a dumb example. One actually that is extremely hard and I don't know how to answer in general, uh, the circle. <laughs> so the circle, um, if I take, if I take a rotation of the circle, a rigid rotation, what is its centralizer? What's, what commutes with a rigid rotation? Well, if the rotation is trivial, like if it's the identity, then everything commutes with it. Okay, so that's huge centralizer. Uh, but if I take a, a rotation through an irrational multiple of two pi, then every orbit is dense and certainly it commutes with all the rotations, right? And so it has a, it, in fact, it doesn't commute with anything else. It's not hard to see. Um, you just sort of play around with this. So now here's a question. What happens when you perturb this rotation on the circle? What happens to the centralizer? I mean, generically, the centralizer becomes trivial, but what else can it be? So this question turns out to be kind of difficult, but surprisingly, um, I mean, I think I know the answer. I think the answer is it's either trivial or the circle. <laughs> and moreover, if the centralizer is the circle, well, let's assume that the smooth centralizer is the circle. That means it commutes with a group of rotations, but that means that it's conjugate. Smoothly change of coordinates, it's actually a rotation. Okay, so that would be sort of my guess, but it's highly non-true for homeomorphisms of the circle. So that's why I'm gonna be careful. But it turns out that if you add a little complexity to the problem, for example, if you consider um, a diffeomorphism of the torus um, generated by some, say a diffeomorphism of Tn generated by some matrix in S, L, N, Z, that's say irreducible, and you perturb that inside of the space of say C infinity diffeomorphisms. Well, its centralizer essentially can't change much. And in fact, before I perturb, the centralizer is for an irreducible, diff, diff, this irreducible diffeomorphism, the, the centralizer is some virtually up to a finite group is up to C to the L. And if I perturb this, the centralizer can only go down. And in fact, it's either Z to the L virtually or Z. And if it's Z to the L, then A is actually conjugate. The perturbation is actually conjugate to A. So that's, I won't take credit for that. That is actually a result. It follows from work of Federico Rodriguez Hertz. and Jiren Wang. But now there's lots of interesting systems, for example, that are algebraic of nature, where the centralizer, 
for example, if I take SLNR mod a co-compact discrete subgroup gamma, I look at this manifold and I let F be translation by the diagonal matrix where these TIs satisfy some genericity properties then the centralizer of F of this left translation acting on this is Z to the N is R to the N minus one. And my current student, Wendy Wong, Jilin, sorry, let me give her first name. Jilin. Wendy Wong has proved that if you perturb this example, let's do it in the case n equals three, then either the centralizer, well, you can perturb this to have trivial centralizer, that's not hard. So you can perturb this to have centralizer Z. And it is possible to perturb it so that the centralizer is R, it's just a flow. But otherwise, the centralizer is R2, this is for n equals three, and the perturbation is smoothly conjugate to the F line. And those are the only possibilities. So that's the kind of, and the reason this is somehow easier than the circle, it's not an easy argument at all, but this reason this is somehow easier is that there's a mix of hyperbolicity and non-hyperbolicity, and they're so well mixed together, and the structure of the orbits of this is rich enough uh, it, that you can, and, and what's called the stable and the unstable foliation. So the orbits of, of these subgroups is sufficiently rich that you can recapture just by assuming you have a little bit more symmetry than this, you can recapture um, everything. Um, and maybe, uh, no, it is actually three o'clock. So I'm going to skip one other bragging about another student's work. Um, anyway, so this is, this is the kind of thing that, that that I'm working on now with my collaborators and students. And, um, oh, by the way, <laughs> so uh, just wanted to do a little advertisement. Um, Benson Farb is giving uh, Minerva lectures at Princeton at 4.30, in case you're interested. I'll leave that up. Okay. Other questions? So, no. Uh, so, so you you explain to us that at least that it's the situation is very different between r equals to one and r greater than one. Yes. Is there any other r from which we understand that r equals two is different from r equals seven, or some other kind of results, or is it only one is different from five? So yeah, the question of breaks in regularity and dynamics. There are several depending on the context of the dynamics. So in studying circle diffeomorphisms. There's a break in dynamical behavior between C1 diffeomorphisms of the circle whose derivatives have bounded variation and C1 derivatives, C1 whose derivatives don't have bounded. <laughs> so there's basically a large break between C2 and C1 in that case. Um, there's often in smooth dynamics a big break between C1 and C1 plus Holder. Um, and that's in hyperbolic dynamics. You see that a lot. Um, I once wrote a paper that I kind of enjoyed that with a former student, Lizzie Burslam, where we studied um, groups, solvable groups acting on the circle. And in particular, we studied groups satisfying the bomb sog solitar relation, A, B, A inverse equals B squared. And we showed that if I have a group that satisfies this relation, I can find an action of this that is um, CR on the circle. So for every R, there's a CR action that is um, CR, but not, okay, now I actually have to see what it's, it's an action that's CR rigid, but not CR plus one rigid. Actually, I should remember the statement in the theorem. Um, but basically, um, the action is um, 
it's a sorry it's an analytic action and it's CR conjugate to a um, kind of rigid action of, of related in that sense and it's not uh, CR plus one conjugate so you could do that for every R so yeah, but most things there's a break between. And then if you get into more elliptic, I don't know why I'm pointing to helmet in particular, but if you start looking at KAM theory and more like parabolic and elliptic dynamics, um, then the smoothness of the system itself is very important in whether you find invariant structures like um, elliptic islands. Sometimes that can be a break from, well, I don't know how well the breaks are understood, but there's definitely um, surfaces of break between C2 and C3. So that's all I know. It goes. Any other question? So uh, you said that the result you would, uh, that you gave us a proof, uh, that's true in different categories like uh, symplectic, volume. Yes. For C1, though. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so let's thank our speaker again for this.